Good morning, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome to the Institute. Uh, many uh, familiar faces and new faces as well. My name is Rory Quinn. I'm the chairperson of the Institute. Uh, and we're delighted to welcome you back here on your second visit with an elevated title as the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Um, the Institute is very welcome to have you. Uh, we are partners in the European Union and we'd be very interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, that's a timely reminder to turn off your... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's a good way to do it. So without further ado, I'd like to invite you to address the audience and we'll have a question and answer uh, session after that. So thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Um, I have a written speech, but I prefer to, instead of reading it, go through it and uh, to give ample time to your remarks, question, and we'll have um, time for that. Uh, as you heard from the introduction, this is my second time here. Just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I was a director. <laughs> it's my second time here. The first time I was here in my capacity as Minister for Home Affairs and National Security. And uh, at that time, I try to address at least our experience in terms of my country when it comes to migration. It seems to me that almost nothing changed or, or things got worse at times, so, uh, but migration maybe um, uh, we'll, we'll speak about it um, if there are questions uh, or uh, even during my speech. Um, I would like to begin to, by making a reference to the European Commission's white paper on the future of Europe. Uh, this was in 2017, um, where the scope of this paper was to uh, set, uh, set out possible paths for the future of the continent. And I quote from, from this uh, white paper. While the world has never been smaller or better connected than the present day, the return of isolationism has cast doubts over the future of international trade and multilateralism. When I read this quote, it seems that to complicate matters to the current global and regional challenges, now we have uh, in recent um, years and months uh, also put doubts on whether multilateralism works or not. And I think that this is one of the, the challenges that we have to face when it comes to how we deal with uh, global, global issues. Um, one can say that, without any doubts, multilateral cooperation is facing a crisis. And Brexit is just another setback in this regard. Instead of working together, uh, we are... Um, uh, <coughs> one of the biggest member states is, the, is departing the European Union. Of course, Malta fully respects the, the democratic decision taken by the United Kingdom, although, of course, we, uh, we still find it hard to uh, come to terms with the fact that the, the United Kingdom will leave the European Union. Um, we go back centuries with the United Kingdom. Uh, we were colonized by the United Kingdom. Um, we know the now, feeling. We know the feeling. Yes. <laughs> uh, then uh, we became partners in the European Union, members of the Commonwealth as well, and now this, this uh, big country is leaving the European Union. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, now we are experiencing that it's not easy for any country to leave the European Union. Um, we have to deal with, uh, with all the possibilities at the moment, and there is uncertainty uh, of what's going to happen. Um, of course, we do sympathize with and understand also the Irish concerns, um, most notably when it comes to the border issues. And this afternoon, as soon as we leave from here, I will be visiting the border crossing at, uh, now, pardon me if I don't pronounce it uh, correctly, Arconel. No, you don't re recognize, recognize that. So it's definitely, it's A-R-D-G-O-N-E-L-L. -L. 
It's on, excuse me, Minister, it's on the Monaghan Army Monaghan. border. Monaghan. Okay, Monaghan. you see? The translation. <laughs> So that will give me the opportunity, of, apart from learning how to pronounce it, um, uh, give me, gives me the opportunity to understand better what is at stake when we talk about the border issue. Um, when it's, the United it's the Kingdom. ecclesiastical capital of Ireland. So I feel mo mo much more at home there. Yes. Um, of course, uh, <coughs> Ireland and Malta, we do have a long-standing and strong relationship with the United Kingdom, irrespective of whether we were colonized by them. But, uh, um, and it's our wish to, to continue to nurture um, this relationship that goes back in history. Um, and, of course, it's also in the interest of our respective peoples to do so. As the United Kingdom usually say, um, they are leaving the EU, but not Europe. Yes. Which means that still we have to, to work together. Um, and it's within the scope of multilateralism as well, if we believe that multi multilateralism is the way forward to, to solve or tackle in the best possible way the challenges that we have. So uh, I would like to, to, to speak a, a bit about multilateralism. Um, of course, nothing is perfect in life, uh, but until now we don't have um, a better solution than work together rather than work in isolation. And uh, definitely when we um, listen today or hear today uh, issues regarding trade wars, which are becoming um, you know, even bigger. Um, in these days there, there are talks, again, uh, with the two most big economies, the United States and China, what will happen in those talks. Um, the rise of populism. Um, in Europe, but not only. And also the erosion of the international rules-based approach when it comes to uh, a number of, of challenges. Um, in recent times, we are also experiencing uh, certain, let's say, difficulties when it comes to the transatlantic relationship, and which today is being challenged at the bilateral but also at the multilateral level. And in these last few days, I had uh, testified personally to, to uh, speeches uh, that came from um, eminent persons in the United States and the way they, they spoke about the European Union, what, uh, what we feel that should be the way forward on a number of issues, um, including JCPOA, including um, uh, Iran, um, and, and um, other challenges that, that we have. Of course, we do share the common values. At least we have to start from somewhere to find the, the common ground, and uh, especially respect for democracy, human rights, rule of law, uh, but also our relationship has developed um, um, and grown when it comes also to security and prosperity. We need, we need to, to fight uh, terrorism, for example, uh, together. Um, terrorism knows no border and likewise should be our action when it comes to, uh, to terrorism. So there is a, a long list, so to speak, of issues that we have to uh, to work together and there is exponential cooperation that can be pursued by both sides. But we have to continue with the dialogue, with the dialogue and not up to a certain extent um, say certain words that might be interpreted in a different way. So maybe we arrived at a time where the concept of multilateralism uh, needs to be renewed. Um, if we want to, uh, together, um, accomplish something when it comes to the challenges that, that we have. Now, we are both um, small member states in the European Union and beyond, of course. We are even micro, a micro state when it comes to uh, our, our uh, country. Um, but we have what we call a Mediterranean vocation. Um, 
Notwithstanding Brexit, the EU is still and a clear example of how countries can work together um, when it comes to the economy, when it comes to political partnership, especially towards peace, um, and also achieving a high degree of cooperation and success in a multitude of fields. Uh, definitely Ireland's contribution to the European Union is truly uh, commendable. It has made a success out of membership and it was also a model for us when we were discussing uh, and, and, and trying to find a model for, for ourselves back, back then before 2004. And most of the time Ireland was mentioned as, as a model also for, for us as, as a future member state and then when we um, uh, became a member state. Um, this, this model, this also applies to my country. So if when it comes to, to countries, size did matter, it's Malta as the smallest EU member state uh, would and should not have much influence on, on matters pertaining to, for example, the EU foreign policy. Um, but this line of thinking, however, should consider two important factors that is regional influence, but also added value. And uh, I think these two aspects help us to be, uh, let's say, relevant, irrespective of the size of our, our countries. Um, for almost now 15 years, EU membership um, employed a strategy with highly focused goals and political initiatives, which represent a regional common interest. Uh, this means that uh, this allows to maximize our influence uh, when it comes to, to us as a country, while acting in concert in, its, in our respective <coughs> niches. So this is, in a nutshell, is our experience when it comes to our role and whether we are effective or not, or at least relevant or not, within a union of 28 till today. As you know, Malta is strategically located in the center of the Mediterranean, um, but it's also geographically and historically close to North Africa. When we go to Tunisia, for example, we fly north. So Tunisia is further north, is closer to Europe than we are, actually. Um, we never shied away from promoting the interests of the Mediterranean region in the European context. And um, while sharing with our European partners the lessons learned from our Euro-Mediterranean reality. I remember, and we repeat every now and then, uh, the, the, the concept that there is no peace and security in Europe unless there is peace and security in the Mediterranean. Um, this was something that one of our previous prime ministers had insisted in, in, uh, in the Helsinki uh, declaration in <coughs> mid-70s. Yes, and it's still relevant today. Yeah. Because some countries that are maybe not close enough to the Mediterranean when it comes to geography, uh, they are no, not even close, uh, let's say, in, in, in this mentality that uh, when we look at the Mediterranean, we see that there are a lot of, 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 of issues and challenges that we have to deal with. North Africa as a whole, maybe we can mention Libya in particular at the moment, the migration issue, uh, Middle East, which is two hours away from us, uh, if we fly from Tel Aviv, for example, directly to Malta, it's two hours, just two hours. It takes us longer to come to Brussels rather than to go to Tel Aviv. Uh, Syria, which, is, which has become a regional issue now, not just Syria in itself, but involved five, six other countries in the region, uh, Yemen as well. So, you know, all these are part or very close to the Mediterranean. Um, and definitely, directly or indirectly, have an impact on um, member states. So, we have these challenges, but do we only focus on the challenges or we can exploit also and see if there are opportunities? And I feel that there are opportunities as well. Um, of course, we need to promote stability, uh, peace, and um, Know, secure our borders, that's important. Um, we need to, to um, have that in place because then if we don't have this in place we will not have economic prosperity. Um, so to, to um, 
say something about our southern neighborhood. Um, this region is facing serious challenges ranging from conflict to terrorism, to extremism, radicalization, social uh, inequity and the lack of economic growth. This is the scenario in the southern um, um, neighborhood of the European Union. So Europe's external policy is aimed at countering these threats to have <coughs> peace as much as possible in the region. Um, so it is important to, to forge a stronger link between the European neighborhood policy and the Union for the Mediterranean. Um, and in this framework, we, we have, um, from a political perspective at least, we have to uh, maintain the European neighborhood instrument separate and adequately financed in the next multi-annual financial framework, and that would be in the EU strategic interest. So when we invest money, when we allocate money in the MFF for the southern neighborhood, we are not just allocating money uh, for other countries, but we are also investing in our own interest. Um, I mentioned Libya. I will not go into uh, the detail, at least, of how important uh, is that Libya becomes a stable country, um, in a nutshell, we do follow and support what the uh, UN uh, Secretary Representative Gassan Salame is doing. I think he's doing an excellent job when it comes to dealing with all the factions, with dealing with all the uh, main leaders in Libya. It's not an easy task, definitely. One key element is security. Uh, because one day you might say, well, things look good today. The following day, something else happens. So the issue of security is crucial uh, if we want to have a political process which have to be Libyan-owned and Libyan-led um, with the support of the international community. Um, and the Libyans need this, this support. Um, but they, first and foremost, they need to get together and uh, you know, be convinced themselves, first and foremost, that they need to go to, through this, this process. They have to agree also on the rules of the game when it comes to elections. It's useless not agreeing on the rules of the, games, of the game when it comes to election because otherwise we'll have problem when the results are um, published. So they need to, to also uh, agree on that and it's not easy. It's not easy to enact the legislation and the constitution amendments and of course it's not easy because they know that not everyone can win. And who today has some kind of authority or leadership, that person might lose that kind of authority and leadership after the election. So the situation is quite uh, challenging, um, but we need not to lose hope, at least. When it comes to the Middle East peace process, at the time being, one can easily say that we have no process going on. Um, now with the elections in Israel, of course, we have to await the results of that election in April. Um, our position when it comes to um, the, the Middle East, um, both Ireland and Malta, we believe in a two-state solution. Uh, of course, dialogue has to prevail even when it comes to difficult questions such as um, the capital city. And that's why we, we, we think that uh, with the declaration that Jerusalem is the capital city of one state, of Israel. Um, that's something that uh, did not help in the process, not at all at least. It didn't help. And we think that dialogue should be, um, uh, should prevail and also that all actors are involved. Today the Palestinians feel that um, the US on their own cannot be trusted. That's how, what, what they say publicly. Um, and I feel that the European Union is in, in, it, in its interest to take a more visible role, uh, to be around the table of discussion and to have an active role when it comes to the Middle East. Because after all, Middle East, it's in our neighborhood and it's in our interest to, to, to secure um, security there. Usually when we have political instability, then the economy, we cannot pretend that it goes well. But then there, there is what I call the third element, which is the humanitarian aspect. And people are suffering from these 
um, situations, not only in the Middle East, but also where we have conflicts. So first we start with political um, uh, difficulties, uh, stability, then of course the economy cannot blossom, but then there is the humanitarian crisis. I mean, to give another uh, example, Venezuela, what's happening now, it's, it turned to be now a, a, a humanitarian crisis with difficulties to uh, send also humanitarian aid uh, in, in, in this country. And when it comes to the Middle East, we know that UNRWA had uh, received less funds, which means that um, education, social uh, uh, help and other uh, needs are, are, are lacking. Which means that we are not investing in the future, because if we don't provide education for <coughs> the children, what can we expect that they do in the future, when, if there is a future for them? Uh, but we are not investing either in security. Because if they are not in the classroom, what are they going to do? And if they know that someone is, uh, is prohibiting from these funds to, to, to arrive to them for, their, uh, for the daily basic services uh, for which they have a right, um, then uh, you know, um, we end up um, seeing the news and um, violence will, will, will again uh, start. So this is, in a nutshell, what, what I, I think is happening there. And definitely we need to have um, a process. We were hopeful that Kushner will come with the so-called deal of the, the century. Uh, we were a bit let down last week when he was in Poland. He didn't say anything because he said, well, maybe rightly so now, that there is an election coming in Israel. And we talk about that after the election. Um, but we are awaiting this for some, quite some time before even the elections were announced. So um, let's, let's even here, this is a long-standing issue, 70 years have passed. At times we became immune when we listened to the news about what's happening there. I, I visited the region twice um, and you see the disparity between one country and, and the other. Uh, when it comes to Syria, definitely we condemn in the strongest uh, possible terms, the use of chemical weapons. Um, even here, we are talking about a humanitarian crisis when we have um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees that left Syria, not because they wanted, but because they were forced to do so. And then one thing leads to the other, because then you have refugees leaving their, their country of origin and they are going in other countries which have to deal with huge amount of, of persons, yeah. uh, both in Europe, but not only in Europe, even in, in Lebanon, for example, Jordan, uh, they, they are hosting um, millions and they are spending uh, millions of euros for the daily needs. Uh, but also in Europe, we had to deal with the situation of uh, refugees and migrants. Um, of course, Syria, it's, it's, it's a bit of uh, another conflict that now we're approaching the 10th year. Um, and at times we have a chicken-egg situation when it comes, for example, the reconstruction of Syria. In Europe we are saying, well, first the regime will go and then we consider to help uh, with, with uh, reconstruction. Um, but are we sure that the regime will go? And if there is no reconstruction <coughs> going on, how do we expect that refugees will return to their own country? Because they will not have um, a, a hope where to go. So I think this is uh, what I'm referring to as a chicken or egg uh, situation, which comes first. Uh, the political process and the hope that there will be a change in the regime, in the current uh, leadership or, or uh, reconstruction. Just to mention one, one, one issue. There are also a number of actors there and, and interests. And I think that maybe we lost an opportunity some years ago um, to, to meet around the table to at least have some common goals when it comes to Syria. Um, and this was not done um, in, in, in the past. Um, let me say something about, about Africa. Um, the way we as Europeans look at the African continent is that we're a member of Africa mainly because we have an issue with migration. Um, 
but we need to build a partnership with the African continent, with the African countries. They need to feel that we are partners and they need to feel that we are interested in the development or in the further development of, of uh, this great continent. I, I think in, in our mentality, at least uh, speaking from behalf of uh, a number of Maltese, is that when we're a member of Africa or a country in, in, in Africa, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is poverty, which is a reality. But we have to admit that poverty is a reality also in, in Europe. Um, we need to mention that. Maybe it's a different kind of poverty as well, but, but still. Um, but we have to say that uh, there are good things also going on in a number of African countries. There are also huge opportunities for investment. There, are also, uh, there is also investment happening in a number of countries, African countries, uh, that is, is um, giving its, its, its fruit and providing work uh, for, for the local population. Um, so it's not just poverty, it's not just migration. Uh, in a nutshell, I feel that as Europeans we need to have a new narrative for the African continent. And I have to admit that I was pleased when uh, Jean-Claude Juncker made the speech of the Union, uh, the State of the Union speech, uh, and he mentioned this, uh, that we as Europeans need to have a new narrative when it comes to Africa to be seen as partners, as, as, as equals, and not just that we need, you know, we point fingers, you do this, you do that, uh, and, and that's... Um, that's not good for, for the African leaders, of course. Uh, so we need to build this relationship, this partnership with the African continent and the, grab the opportunities that, that exist also for uh, businesses in, in, in Europe. We, uh, from our end, we are trying to uh, enhance the relationship with, uh, with Africa, not only with the African, sorry, with the with North Africa, where we have you know, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, Egypt. Um, that's more or less a given since the proximity, sure. uh, geographically proximity of, of, of these countries, but also uh, sub saharan uh, countries. And we decided to open uh, our first embassy, sub-Saharan embassy, which is going to be, which is in Ghana, basically, um, trying to cater for, you know, the... Uh, that part of the uh, African continent, definitely one embassy is not enough, but uh, you know, limited resources when it comes to human resources mainly, and then financial resources. Uh, but little by little we are, we are looking at the African continent, not only the north part, but also um, in the very heart of, of, of Africa. I was pleased when I had the opportunity to visit uh, Ghana in July of 2017, accompanying Her Excellency the President, um, that we had a trade delegation with us. And I was pleased that the local business community, the Maltese local business community, um, we had for us a substantial number, uh, more than 20 actually, which for us is, uh, let's say, um, a good number when it comes to a region that we do not have um, direct connectivity, uh, that it's a new region for us, it's a new country for us. So I really admire the fact that uh, these, these uh, companies uh, wished to explore, and I know that they continue to go there on their own, and there are good prospects for them to make some, um, some uh, good deals with, with, uh, in Ghana. Likewise, we have Ethiopia, which is becoming much bigger uh, in importance. There is also the seat of the African Union there. So we are we are we also um, uh, appointed an ambassador specifically for for Ethiopia and um, the African Union. While before we used to cover that from Egypt, it's not a resident ambassador, but still at least uh, this this ambassador can be uh, focused. I'm I'm saying this because I think as Europeans now. Uh, we need to have more focus on the African continent from a dif different perspective. And we are trying to do something at least that we can, we can afford to do when it comes to, to the African continent. Um, 
we should speak of trade and not aid. Um, yes, there are projects going on from NGOs, even the European Union is, is the major donor when it comes to, to development. Uh, but still, I think that we need to build the par partnership not on giving money, aid, but uh, helping uh, the, the, these countries to, um, to develop and we need to invest there. Then we need to invest quickly in the sense that we are competing with other countries. We're not on our own there. Uh, the Africans want to work with Europe, want to work with um, the European Union. But of course we have to be more, let's say, um, less bureaucratic. Because uh, the, the, jokingly maybe they say, well, if we ask uh, the Chinese, the Russians, the Turks maybe to, to come and do a project, they will come and the following day they will start. If we ask the same to the European Union, the following day you see a number of bureaucrats coming, you have to fill this, you have to fill this. Um, and we know that we have uh, the um, procurement regulations, which of course we are bound to follow, but I think we need to, uh, uh, from the administrative point of view, be more effective. Uh, otherwise we will, will, will lose um, when it comes to competition from other countries as well. Now we are talking about the post Cotonou agreement and uh, how that will be uh, negotiated. Um, and in these negotiations, negotiations, what I feel is that we have to listen carefully to what Africa is saying. It's not just us, but it's them as well. So we need to listen carefully uh, to, to that. Um, Finally, I, I would like to, to mention uh, the United Nations, because the United Nations is seen to be as the multilateral uh, fora par excellence. And uh, I know that Ireland is seeking to be one of the non-permanent uh, seats at the United uh, Nations Security Council. Uh, we are doing the same uh, soon after Ireland. At least that, that's our hope. Uh, we are bidding for one of the non-permanent seats. Um, and I think that we bring uh, a lot, and we will bring a lot to the Security Council. Um, from our perspective, how we see things, um, and other countries, the, the big countries especially, um, can look at us as, as partners and not as a threat. Uh, maybe there are sometimes at times there are suspicions that uh, you know a big country might propose something because there is something behind. In our case, uh, you get what you see, um, and and uh, I think that we are really uh, we can play a role uh, in 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 that as well. So um, we share common goals and uh, common aspirations based on our European legacy uh, of dialogue, engagement and values. Uh, this is something common to Ireland and to my country. And uh, I think that we are very much like-minded as well, even if we look at our constitution. We have neutrality in our constitution. We are not NATO members. Um, and uh, these are um, things that um, brings us even closer uh, together in friendship uh, that exists between the respective countries and hopefully this will continue uh, in the future also for the uh, mutual benefit of our people. I'll stop here. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>